Good afternoon, welcome, and thank you for tuning in to our latest COVID-19 Facebook Town Hall. I'm Colonel Will Marshall, Commander of the 48th Fighter Wing, uh, along with my teammate down the road, Colonel Troy Pennon, Commander of the 100th Air Refueling Wing. This afternoon, we'd like to take a few minutes of say a couple things and then take your questions. Uh, with that, as we both addressed on Saturday afternoon, we have our first two positive cases of COVID-19, one active duty military member and one dependent. Uh, from the two wings. Our public health experts have completed the tracing process necessary to identify those individuals that our positive individuals have been in contact with and we're stepping out on containment measures in order to make sure that we can contain the spread of this disease. Yeah, and with that in mind, I think what is really important and what we've always addressed with all of our airmen and their families is really to be conscientious to enforce and in place all of the preventative measures that you know all of the CDC and everybody that has instructed us on is being important to prevent the spread of this virus. One of the things that's come up both in the questions and as we've been around the base is the balance between protecting the force uh, and continuing our mission. And with that, a couple things to say, and we'll address this later on in the questions. Uh, both of us, uh, our wings have a combat mission that we continue to execute. So the projection of combat air power remains one of our must-dos uh, for both of those two wings. Additionally, there are those essential services on base, the commissary, the BX, those kind of life, safety, health uh, services that we have to maintain for our forces. So as we go through how we mitigate and slow the spread of this disease and how we do some kind of reduced manning, main sure that we, making sure that we maintain our combat mission while taking care of our folks remains one of those balancing factors that we have to take into account. And we're both really looking hard at, at you know, how we can reduce the hours and reduce the risk to the individuals that work on our installation. And so it's really important that um, we get the information, we process it, and we take deliberate measures to ensure the safety of everybody that calls Milner Hall and Lake and Heath home. And with that, uh, it's incumbent upon all of us to continue to make sure that we're abiding by the things the Med Group and our public health officials have asked us to do. Strong personal hygiene, making sure we're washing our hands, uh, abiding by social distancing, limiting groups, all those kind of things that we all can do in order to help our health officials slow the spread uh, of this disease. And we'll be making sure that we step out and we are closely monitoring those folks in quarantine and isolation, uh, and we'll talk more about that a little bit later. Uh, with that, we're ready to uh, start addressing some of the questions uh, that came in beforehand, uh, and then we'll take questions as they come in online. Troy? Okay. Uh, so the first question that came in uh, was, any plans to close the commissary or FSS facilities on base? Uh, so with that, uh, as I alluded to before, many FSS facilities have already closed uh, or reducing hours. And, and a couple of minor differences between the two wings is we look at things like gyms, uh, and I think you'll see a little bit more reduction in the 48th Fire Wing gym here uh, at Lake and Heath within the next day. Uh, we have looked at how we can minimize risk uh, by closing a lot of facilities, reshuffling some of the workers around in those facilities, uh, and uh, outright closing uh, others or reducing hours throughout. As to the commissary, there is no plans to close the commissary right now. I have every intention of keeping that open because to me that is one of those vital services on base in order to provide a safe environment for our families to come in to procure food for home. Perfect. Uh, the next question was, any plans for use or lose leave? Okay, so this is something that Big Air Force is going to be responsible for and looking at. Right now, they are reviewing special leave accrual and how they can implement that. The guidance is coming, so I would say stand by. Your chain of command will get the answers as soon as possible. Okay, sorry. <laughs> I forgot we we're doing the back and forth. It works. <laughs> All right, how about this one? What are we doing to ensure members are socially distancing themselves? Uh, well, other than I try to socially distance myself from the 100th every opportunity I get, uh, the main thing I would say is we're counting on grown-ups and professionals to be grown-ups and professionals. Uh, so we've issued the direction of all those kind of things that folks need to be doing. Uh, we've done a lot of things like putting little footsteps out in the BX and the commissary uh, and trying to enforce that. Uh, but ultimately, we're counting on grown-ups and professionals to be grown-ups and professionals. Uh, and for our parents to be parents. And I say that a little bit tongue in cheek, uh, but at the end of the day, what we really need to do is all of us to be aware of how this virus spreads and, and, mitigate, or, and mitigate and reduce our own personal risk uh, that we're showing. Yeah, very, very good. Um, uh, so with that, our next question is, 
If a member has PCS orders for right after the stop movements, i.e. 12 May, should they anticipate leaving on time? Yeah, um, so a great question, and I think right now um, that is yet to be seen. The current status is 11 May is the stop movement. It could get extended based on conditions that are surrounding the world and where we stand. Um, we can anticipate some delays. I think I've seen already some traffic where report no later than dates have been slipped to the right. Again, this is a highly dynamic situation. As things continue to improve, hopefully, uh, we will start to see some of those dates roll back to what we would be accustomed to for your normal timeline. But stand by, information is still flowing, and really it is, it goes back to being, you know, having those good practices, making sure that we stop the curve, you know, break the curve and break and mitigate any risk that presents itself to our families and our force. Will contractors still be allowed on base? Short answer, yes. Uh, so to our point before when we talk about continuing our mission uh, of projecting combat air power and providing essential services uh, and goods on base, our contractors, uh, both our regular folks and the folks that are coming in for special projects are a key part of that. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's no intention right now to closing or reducing access uh, to those contractors that come on base. Uh, are there plans to cancel flying? Right now, there are no plans to cancel flying. We have reduced some flying operations, but um, both of us have a, you know, kind of a deliberate and purposeful mission that we need to go out and execute. And as the sole air refueling wing in the SAFE and AFRICOM, or Africa, we provide a lot of support to customers that are external to this location. And so we are gonna continue those missions, those operations, and I'm sure the 48 is as well. Absolutely correct. So we, you will probably see a reduction in flying schedule as we are moving our manpower around to again mitigate risk with how we have people in the flying squadrons at the same time, our people in the control tower, our air traffic control, all those kind of uh, individuals to try to spread them out and mitigate the risk. So you almost certainly see a reduction in the amount that we're flying, but a cancellation of flying at this time is not planned because again we have to get after the projection combat air power. It says here, um, if Boris puts the UK in lockdown, where does that leave LNDH? Well, as Colonel Pentagon talked about before, all of our different categories uh, of employees, be they uh, government service civilians, local national direct hire, or Ministry of Defense, there's a little bit different rule set uh, amongst each of those. What I would say for our LNDH employees, if the Prime Minister puts the country in lockdown, then as always, we will abide by the host nation uh, rules, regulations, and laws uh, so we would expect all of our LNDH employees to stay home uh, and we will work through the entitlements uh, uh, part of that uh, afterwards. Okay. Um, I think that concludes the questions and answers or the questions that were directed towards us. Um, we're, we're, we're wondering, yeah, if there's any on the, on the line right now that are watching that might have some questions for us. Uh, what steps have been taken to sanitize the area the two individuals may have touched? Uh, that's a great question. I'll talk about it on the 48th uh, side first. Uh, so the uh, workplace where our positive active duty member uh, worked, we actually brought a contract team in uh, and cleaned that building professionally uh, with that team over the weekend. Additionally, that building is currently closed uh, for the next couple of days while we work through the, uh, the follow-on part uh, of that. Yeah, and for the member that was assigned to RAF Milden Hall, um, we obviously did the trace analysis. The good news is, is that family was under self-quarantine already. They went to isolation, and then when the symptoms developed more, they sought medical help and assistance, and that was where the test was conducted, and they found out that they were positive. So from a standpoint of trace analysis, there was limited exposure to the outside populace. Uh, they, were, they stayed within their house, so in my estimation and in the medical group estimation, there was very, very low risk to external agencies and or personnel and families. And that's a great point, Troy. Uh, I think both of these are good cases to where we had individuals that became symptomatic, immediately identified themselves, contacted our medical authorities, put themselves in quarantine while we waited for test results to, came back, to come back, and mitigated and minimized the amount of individuals they could have infected with the disease during that inner time period. And actions like that are gonna be critical in order to, as you say, flatten the curve. Are there any other questions? 
currently what what is being done in common areas to help clean um, and look after sanitation mm -hmm. for you know additional guests that are coming through right. first. Sure. yeah and so we do have in a lot of cases we do have contract cleaning companies that know the proper protocols to ensure the safety and disinfect and remove the chances of the virus being spread or placed onto work surfaces and the and the areas uh, what we've noticed is when we've reduced our manning uh, there isn't as much areas that need to be cleaned as often as normal and so right now what we're trying to do is kind of vector our cleaning staff to those areas where they can focus attention on commonly you know operated and common areas that we usually utilize and we also have done a large purchase bulk purchase of type of proper cleaning supplies and protective equipment to ensure that even us as individuals are able to take care and clean up after ourselves. Likewise, and I would say for areas like our dining facilities, the gym, uh, those areas where we have uh, folks coming through on a more frequent basis, uh, we have stepped up the frequent cleaning throughout that while continuing to emphasize personal hygiene for everybody involved. The next question is about the fitness centers. Um, it says, with the RAF Mildenhall gyms being closed as of this afternoon, will 24-hour access still be permitted? Right. Um, so for us, it is um, closed permanently or until further notice. And so no 24-7 access. We did have the gyms on 24-7 CAC-enabled access for an extended period of time, and now we just have stopped that. Um, and so right now, both of our gyms on RAF Mildenhall are closed. Uh, on RAF Lake and Heath, uh, recognize the fitness facility is a key part of the resilience for many of our folks. Uh, I try to uh, keep that open as long as possible. Based upon the recommendation of public health and our own recommendation at our own recognition of the procedures and the risk profile as we went through that facility, uh, effective most likely tomorrow, the weight room in that facility will be closed uh, because we discovered that the social distancing was becoming a problem in there uh, and making sure the equipment was staying clean. Uh, we really couldn't uh, stand behind that. However, at this time, based upon the great work of the FSS has done of spreading out the machines uh, and through my own personal uh, anecdotal evidence of watching folks in there doing a good job of cleaning the machines before and after use, I intend to maintain the cardio room open at this time and potentially some other areas in the gymnasium uh, so folks have an opportunity, particularly in, in the sometimes bad weather here in the UK, are those folks that may not necessarily be able to go out and run on the outside based on their health issues or whatever it may be, so they have a chance to, uh, to come in and exercise. We will, however, uh, as this disease continues to develop, uh, our local risk profile based upon uh, the cases here, the cases on base, cases in the local community, uh, and as we watch the users and our own staff ability to maintain that facility, continue to evaluate that, uh, and should the risk become untenable, untenable, we'll close the cardio room and the other facilities there as well. But as for now, I intend to maintain it during duty hours only. We too shut down our 24 hour access just because in the off hours, it was less uh, possible for us to make sure that we were policing it uh, and the sanitization was staying up to standard. Uh, next question, um, considering how easy it is to uh, work from laptops and potentially work from home, why are there still individuals that have to come into base to work? Yeah, so I think for the most part that we want to ensure that people understand and that the audience understands is that some of the tasks that we assign to our personnel aren't really capable of being performed on a uh, home enabled or work issued device. Uh, things like working on the aircraft themselves, doing the, the maintenance that is required to sustain the base, those things must continue to uh, occur because again, it goes back to how do we project combat power and we need this base operating in order to do that. 100% agree. So the defender still has to be at the gate, defender still has to be in the patrol car, patrol in the area. Uh, you can't replace a stab actuator on an F-15 uh, through a laptop. Uh, and then because of all those folks that have to be here doing things and the families that live with them, there are certain essential support activities as well that require an in-person uh, touch uh, in order to uh, deliver that service. Uh, so we will continue to do that uh, to support both the mission and our families. And we are obviously going to stress this 
uh, what we've both done and what a lot of the bases have done is try to find creative ways to minimize contact, um, minimize the amount of people that need to come in and do those kind of things, change the staff actuator. Do we need 10 people? No, we don't need 10 people. We might need two. Um, and obviously monitoring and ensuring that they both, both you know, have taken the proper mitigated um, safety measures. So yes, makes sense. What about air crews that are TDY or maybe transient? Um, are they required to stay on base and or self-quarantine at any point? And perhaps is it different if they're coming from a level two country versus a level three country? Probably, probably it's probably mine. This is probably mine. Okay, so RAF Golden Hall does tend to be more of a transit base, and so what we have is direct guidance on how we uh, basically take care of the air crew members, and honestly speaking, for the most part, because we can control the process and the mitigation and ensure the safety of the crew, um, we are pretty much looking at housing all of those air crew members on our installation. And then from there, we're taking the proper measures to ensure that they are, if needed, deliver the foods and essentials to limit the contact that they have and they can continue on their global mission, which is really what occurs more time than not, is individuals that are transiting our base are, no, are here no longer than a day. And so that's really our emphasis. With select facilities like the commissary staying open, how are they accommodating social distancing? I would say largely we're relying on our customers uh, to help us out with that. Uh, so the, st the stores have done, particularly if you go into the BX or the shop at, you'll see the little red, little red steps on the floor uh, of encouraging people where to, step, where to stand. Uh, and you'll see that employees throughout are doing things like wearing gloves. As you enter the commissary, there's an attendant there who's not only checking IDs to limit access to the store but also handing out sanitizing wipes so you can wipe down uh, your cart or your basket uh, whatever the case may be uh, but largely relying on once you're inside the store I'm not going to send a chief over there to uh, break people up uh, and separate them by six feet uh, I'm going to ask our customers to help each other out and give each other a little bit of distance uh, throughout that particularly where that becomes a problem is once you get into the line uh, from my own interactions there and I have two teenage boys so I go to the commissary just about every day uh, from my own interaction, it seems like people are doing a pretty good job with that of trying to give each other a little bit of space throughout this. Yeah, one of the things that we're looking at at our installation, we do have a smaller facility, and so we've asked the commissary director about how can we limit the amount of people that are going into the actual facility itself. And so we're going to try and kind of keep it so that people in a small contained area that we don't exceed a certain amount of individuals in that you know, small confined space, if you will. And so we're taking measures, we're trying to make sure that um, we're falling in line with exactly what Colonel Marshall is doing with his team. With the CDC's closing, is there a plan to help uh, dual working parents, either both active duty or dependents working? Yeah, I'll take this one uh, as well, uh, at least initial swing at this. Uh, as a dual mill couple myself, uh, I am highly attuned uh, to this and closing the CDC was a really hard uh, decision for us. Uh, because I recognize it's not just our dual mill couples, it's also our single parents, uh, and it's our dual working couples who maybe one's a military member uh, and the other member's working somewhere either on or off base. Closing the CDC was a hard decision for us. Uh, we did so in order to, again, try to get in front of this uh, and mitigate the risk. We are looking at if there's a way that we can provide some kind of limited service uh, to those most mission essential uh, and critical parents. We just haven't quite figured out what that might look like yet or if we can do that uh, and stay within the risk tolerances. Yeah, it really comes down to the mission and how we're able to support it. So in our, at our wing, we are making every effort to ensure that we provide a little bit of offset between, if the case may be, two military parents, two working parents, to provide them some coverage when, this, when the children need it and to make sure that they're not left alone. So yeah, uh, we are taking every, uh, making every effort and the commanders and the leadership in the squadrons and in the units um, they are trying to directly address that. If there's concerns or things that we need to do at our level, they are told to come bring it to us so that we can try and find a good solution. Uh, absolutely, and we'll definitely need squadron and, and frontline supervisor help with this uh, because it's not just the kids in the CDC. Uh, there's also a whole bunch of elementary school kids that we uh, will have in remote learning starting this Wednesday. 
uh, that we need direct parental supervision as well uh, based on the uh, guidelines that our two installations have for when uh, kids can be left at home. Uh, so it's really coming down to the best option we have right now is working with the supervisors to try to provide some kind of offset work schedule or, or telework or whatever the case may be so we can provide a parent at home at least in the near term. All right, this next question says, are you aware that housing has stopped the health inspections? Um, essentially, if you're currently in TLF and you're trying to move into a house on the economy, if the house isn't inspected, you can't move out of TLF and into your house. Uh, so is there um, something that could be done to address this issue? Uh, the immediate answer to that is no, I was not aware that we had stopped those inspections um, of trying to get our folks up in the housing off base. Obviously, this has caused a lot of uh, problems throughout the PCS process writ large, uh, and I am very attuned to the fact that moving off base and getting a house here when you first move in uh, is a, a difficult process uh, throughout. Uh, I was not aware of uh, my housing office stopping those health inspections, so I'll go back and take a look at that. The follow-up to that, sir, is some individuals in pet-friendly TLF were told that they might have to vacate and then find a kennel to put their pets in. Uh, is there any additional guidance on that, or do you know if there's truth behind that? Uh, I don't know. I would be surprised if we are forcing anybody out of a TLF room that's already there. Uh, we are extremely short in the amount of pet-friendly TLFs we have. Likewise, since largely the PCS ends have stopped, we're getting very few people in, especially after this week, uh, that tide uh, should turn. Uh, so I was not aware of anyone being told they may have to move out of the TLF, uh, be it pet friendly or not, uh, going forward. Yep, again, not something that we're tracking. I do know that um, one of the things that we're looking at at our installation, as we talked about a little bit earlier, we are a heavily transited base, um, and we do need to try and uh, ensure the safe movement of our air crew as they transit this theater going onward to the next. So there may be instances where uh, mission will dictate um, us asking individuals to potentially move out of lodging, but we're not at that point yet. We haven't reached that threshold. Uh, we're constantly reviewing that. And if that were to be the case, we would be responsible for finding them a alternate location. But I don't think we're there yet, uh, but we will follow up. Yeah, agreed. Can you reiterate when somebody is told to self-quarantine, under what circumstances might they be asked to self-quarantine? Uh, so in essence, if someone believes they are at risk for COVID-19, uh, either whether they be symptomatic or because they have been in contact with someone as in these two individuals that tested positive uh, this week, we will tell them to go into quarantine for the 14 days. Yeah, the other, the other measure that I think um, has been brought uh, from the public health is when they're doing the trace analysis and they follow through and they identify an individual, um, they ask them who they've been in contact with, and then the medical staff is reaching out to those families and informing them, hey, there is a potential risk, we'd like you to self-monitor, and in some cases, absolutely, if you have any symptoms, self-quarantine, and then wait and see if we need to go further. But um, yeah, this is, is important that under a trace analysis, um, identifying individuals that you may have come in contact with so that they can be informed by the medical staff so that they're more aware and we can stop the spread. And then the other uh, condition would be, since we're now a CDC level three country, by definition, anybody that comes here, PCSN, has transited through a level three country. So all the folks that we're receiving, we're putting in that 14 day quarantine period. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, got it. Um, so, uh, the what awesome 48th Medical Group is going to take an opportunity to answer any medically related questions in the feed of this uh, Facebook Live Town Hall. Um, I think what we're planning on for uh, specifically is in the next opportunity, we're going to have another Town Hall uh, later this week to address civilian personnel uh, specific areas and items and concerns. Um, and so that will occur this week as well. We'll set, send out a notification and or an invitation for those that are interested. Good. Any other questions or concerns from the audience? If there are no other questions on the line, uh, I would just like to say that I know this is an extremely challenging time. 
Uh, and this situation has caused a lot of stress for our, our airmen uh, of all sorts and kinds, uh, whether they be military, civilian, uh, LNDH, MOD, all the folks that make up our two wings uh, and their families. A tremendous amount of change has happened over the last month. Uh, if you look back at where we were uh, at the middle of last month to today, uh, I wanna say thank you for your patience. Uh, our medical professionals are doing their very best in order to help us identify the risks, uh, help us to mitigate this disease, to get out guidance in a timely fashion, to allow us to do this with the minimal amount of disruption to you, your family, uh, and the mission. Uh, there's un no doubt going to be more change as we go forward. Uh, I ask for your patience with that, and we will try to return to some kind of normalcy uh, when we can. Uh, the other thing that I would also want to reiterate is being thankful for the local community. Um, you know, we are invited guests here, and we cherish that opportunity to continue to strengthen the relationships. One of the wonderful things about it is, is when we get calls from our local community, they usually ask, what can we do to help you? And in turn, we're like, no, no, what can we do to help you? And really, it's working together, uh, hand in hand. Um, those relationships that we fostered prior to this crisis, uh, they're even stronger now. And so we really do appreciate the assistance that we're receiving from the local community. Um, and because this is going to be a fight that's, that we will win, uh, but it's going to be done together. So appreciate your help. Thank you. Thank you.